Ladies and gentlemen, here's my mommy and daddy from my friend Fred. Afraid of, tell me what you defile, tell me what makes you worry, and tell me what makes you smile. Rednecks, no sex, Oedipus complex, tell me what makes you tick. Post nasal drippage, Freudian slippage, there are so many ways to be sick. I won't say no to you Tell me what you got on your mind I've got all of the answers There's no sense paying those crooks Why I'm a Carnegie graduate And I've read Dr. Dyer's books Psychos get so you can take a fit so Deep neurosis, eyeball thrombosis I'll show you how to pull your own strings What's in your heart of hearts? That's how the treatment starts Describe your romantic sparks Especially the juicy part Tell me what you got on your mind Now, I know this is your first visit to a psychiatrist, Mrs. Brown but I'd like you to try and relax. I'm here to help you. And I can, I can only help you if, if you'll tell me your innermost guilts and fantasies. So don't be shy. You won't shock me. You just talk about whatever comes into your mind, whether it be drinking or illicit drugs or sex or orgies or adultery or people even flogging one another. Well, actually, doctor, I... I'm, I'm just having I'm just having a problem trying to cope. Cope. To cope? Yeah. Cope with what? Sex? Orgies? Adultery? <laughs> flogging? Just exactly what? No, actually, I'm I'm just having a problem. I'm just having a problem trying to cope with the the problems of everyday life and that the pressures of being a person. That's all. I see. And tell me, what do you think is the problem? I don't know. I, I can't explain it. What do you mean? What do you mean, what do I mean? I just said I can't explain it. How can I explain it if I can't explain it? I see. So you think sex is the culprit? I think sex has nothing to do with it. What kind of sex has nothing to do with it? Any kind of sex. Uh-huh. So you're open to any kind of sex. I like that. Doctor. I think my husband's at the root of my troubles. Oh, your husband. And is he open to any kind of sex? <laughs> Not any kind? Doctor, I came here to talk about my problems, and all you keep asking me about is sex, sex, sex. Now, would you please take a different tack? It really makes you uptight, doesn't it? Now, doctor, my husband. He makes me uptight. He's a very successful businessman, and when he comes home from the office, he never asks me how my day was. Oh, he never wants to know... Excuse me, excuse me. I'm sorry. I've heard this one. <laughs> now, I told you before, I'm here to help you. But we're not going to get anywhere if you're going to talk about your husband neglecting you. If you want to talk about your husband drinking or using illicit drugs or having sex or orgies or adultery or flogging people, Fine. If not, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to leave. I'll be glad to. Goodbye, doctor. You're sick. If I don't get some demented perverts in here pretty soon, I'm never going to finish writing this book. <laughs> Can lead to 
psychosis, even Santa is short with his elves. The tension begins to show, I'm okay, your touch and go. Come to me for the cure, you'll be in my book for sure. Tell me what you got on your mind. Thank you. Now here to sing a song that he wrote about a tree is our guest tonight, John Ellis. fairy tale is called The Wicked Curse. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a beautiful young girl named Melissa. She was very popular with the boys because she was good at sports and had a big chest. <laughs> but alas, there was a curse on Melissa. For many years ago, her father had told a Newfie joke to an old broad who turned out to be a witch from St. John's. <laughs> and she put a Newfoundland spell on poor Melissa. What a ting to happen. <laughs> From that day on, Melissa was in a fog. She went to a disco and step danced. She talked funny and 20% of her was unemployed. And every night she prayed for a fairy that would take her to the mainland. <laughs> but alas, to no avail. And a lad to Jerryvale. So Melissa pleaded with the witch saying, Lord, Tundrin, buddy, I've suffered enough now. And the witch answered, kiss my toad. 
But Melissa felt that was a bit pushy for their first date. So she had to find some other way of breaking the spell. She carried a rabbit's foot in horseshoes and put garlic around her neck. Then she tried a rabbit's neck in saddle shoes and put garlic around her horse. After a week, both she and her horse were having trouble getting dates. But the spell remained. And she slept upside down in the barn and ate figs with the animals. And after a week, both she and her horse were having trouble passing dates. But the spell remained. And she consumed four dozen Rolaids because the ad said something about spell relief. But the spell remained. And finally, her father went to the witch and promised that if she would lift the curse, he would never tell another Newfie joke. And the witch told him, well, you know, you're quite welcome here anytime you come, but we don't appreciate your interference or your insults. And with that, she lifted the curse and Melissa lived under stress ever after. <laughs> so remember, they're not all witches, but Newfoundlanders could teach most of us a ting or two, even the ones who can't spell. Here we are again. We've got a little bit of time to kill today because uh, that fairy tale was supposed to go a little bit longer, but uh, people asked me to shorten it. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that maybe we just would talk about something that people uh, are always saying to us, well, not always, but say once every 10 minutes or so. <laughs> They're saying that uh, we seem to really enjoy, you know, doing our show and everything. And I think that's true. What do you think, Marek? Over to you. <laughs> No, it's really a drag. <laughs> it is, really, in a way, but luckily we're on drugs, so we don't know. No, no, no. I'm only kidding, of course. Where are you going? <laughs> Nowhere. I was just going to say that it's it's an enjoyable just kind come of... Just that was fire drill. <laughs> it's an enjoyable kind of life, but um, I think for people like our neighbors, it's a little bit weird. You know, we'll have a pickup truck parked in our driveway one week, and... and um, just when your I parents are over. <laughs> Red Green comes over, and a trike, you know, yeah. that half motorcycle thing, and, um, you know, often we walk around the house in huge cowboy hats, you know, just for a laugh. That's all, though. We have a lot of fun that way. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's a 10 gallon. Anyhow, uh, I think that we do enjoy the show. I'm sure we must, because uh, we're not making any coin at it, you know. Uh, I'll tell you, I think, why I enjoy, particularly why I enjoy the show, uh, and this probably goes for the wife, too. <laughs> I just say that because my neighbor loves it when I say the wife. She hates it. She hates it. <laughs> Who cares? Anyway, I think it's the amount of freedom that we're allowed to have. We can virtually do anything. Maury can dress, obviously, any way she wants. <laughs> and uh, I could get up now and dance. <laughs> and, no, this is the, and the reason for that is not because they believe in our artistic ability. It's because they know no one's watching. <laughs> What difference does it make? As long as we get the show done in around 15 minutes, everybody can go to lunch except Larry Denardis who catches the bowling. Who cares? Who cares what we do? Now, some people have, have asked if we will ever go to an hour. Let's be serious, all right? This is obviously more than we can cope with right now at the 30 minutes. I think, too, that one of the nice things about working here at Channel... We're working for CHCH in Hamilton. <laughs> and one of the, I think one of the reasons that we're allowed to do so much is, believe it or not, this is one of the better shows they're doing. <laughs> well, there's no excuse for that, really. <laughs> now you got a bit of a laugh on you, don't you? That's why I'm tired. <laughs> Morag's mother's here today, so go easy on her. Uh, I guess maybe it's about time for me to say to you, get lost and go and enjoy a little bit more of this program, will you? Here goes Morag. The ambassador from Antarctica. <laughs> gonna do one of my favorite tunes. I say gonna do one of my favorite songs. This boom man has gotta go. This is called Doing It Right. <laughs>
Chevy, put your gas foot down. They're doing it right on the wrong side of town. Doing, doing it right. Doing it right. Doing it right. Doing it right. The blues band's cooking and the drummer's burning down. They're doing it right on the wrong side of town. Chevy, put your gas foot down. They're doing it right on the wrong side of town. Doing it right. Doing it right. Doing it right. Doing it right. The blues band's cooking and the drummer's rolling down. They're doing it right on the wrong side of town. We're at the Comedy Club this week to see Howard Nemitz. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I own a dog and a cat, and I've noticed that a lot of people like to get dogs that suit their personality. Like a really hyper person will get a hyper dog, like a, an Irish setter. Say, you want to go for a walk? Sure. Where do you want to go? Alaska? Come on, let's go. <laughs> but a really mellow guy will get a mellow dog, like a basset hound. Um, you want to go for a walk? Later, man. <laughs> I'm meditating. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, in my house, we have a Jewish dog named Miss Kite. And you ask him, you want to go for a walk? He says, nah, maybe later. <laughs> my back hurts. I can't lift my leg. Don't ask. You don't want to know. Right? But when I was a pup, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, see, I like dogs, but dogs like pleasure too much. Cats are much cooler. You know, you can pat a cat and they got that poker face. They just sit there and go... You know, I love this, but I'm too cool to tell you. <laughs> right? But you got, you got dogs. Like, you can pat a dog for like eight hours until there's no feeling left in your hand. You know? And the second you stop, the dog will look up and go, That's it? Oh, it's, not even, it's not even eight o'clock yet. What are you doing? <laughs> They're really cool. I don't know. And cats, cats are a really clean animal. You don't have to worry about them. You know? they, they just have a litter box. And you don't even have to show them where it is. You just tell them. You know? Second door on your left. Thank you very much. <laughs> You got something for me to read in here? It's going to be a while. Uh, and you don't, you don't see them like, for like eight months, and then they show up, right? And they go, um, look, man, could you change it, please? Because it's not funny anymore, okay? I can't. Not, I mean, it's, I know it's my mess, but I can't. But dogs, you got to walk dogs any time of the day or night, right? Three o'clock in the morning. Oh, uh, now? <laughs> Can't you wait? I waited till you were asleep. Oh, thanks. Man. That's great. And you ever see a dog, like, you know, when you walk him, when he has to, um, well, this is television, right? We've advanced here. When he has to uh, number two, <laughs> and he finds the spot he wants, and he circles for an hour and a half. <laughs> That's because a dog can't make unless he's dizzy. Right? <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Dr. Livingston, and I get my living done deep in the dark of the jungle. Where I built my mission, there were crocodiles fishing, and the lions can keep a man humble. You'll hear the python hissing, and your best friend's missing. You go snaky on your own. It's all jungle cries and tsetse flies, but I call it home. doodle dandy getting my assignment done an american paper put me on 
on this paper to find Dr. Livingston. I've seen the Ganges River, seen a monkey's liver, seen bones in people's hair. I haven't found the place of the man I trace, but I think that's him there. <laughs> Mr. Stanley, I presume whatever brings you to my living room. Oh. I look such a mess, I didn't even shave. If I knew you were coming, I'd have baked the slave. Mr. Stanley, I'm so surprised to see you. What's the news? Well, this is quite a shocker to find you, doctor. It's a challenge I thought I would fail. I came to explain that the world hasn't changed, and also I brought you your mail. They were unable to reach you, so I'm sent here to greet you, cause you never answer your phone. You've been restationed back in civilization, so please come home. Just a minute. Mr. Stanley, yeah? you presume too much. It's much nicer to be out of touch. Back in England, I'm just a dope. Over here, I'm the great white oak. No, thank you, Stanley. I won't be leaving with you. So tell me, doctor, is there room enough here for two? Would you like to stay? Yeah, it's a jungle back there. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, and help us thank our guests, John Ellis and Howard Dennis.